Ladies and gentlemen, we're ready to start the afternoon's program. I'm your uh, vice chairman in absentia until now. And uh, the first speaker, <coughs> excuse me, this afternoon is Ron Gravel, known to pretty well all of you in this field as an expert in the tax and in the estate planning area. Uh, Ron is the uh, man who heads up <coughs> the estate planning section at the Bar Admission Course in Ottawa. And uh, he was a lecturer for some years in that section and uh, a lecturer also from time to time at the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa. He's taken part in several continuing education programs on uh, tax and on estate related matters and he's on the board of directors of the Estate Planning Council of Ottawa. <clears throat> he also is from my old uh, alma mater of uh, Gowling and Henderson. And I was asking him if uh, they still acted for the estate of Mackenzie King because in my day they did and uh, that would uh, consist of Leonard Brockington coming to town once every couple of years and the surrogate court judge setting aside the entire day to hear uh, Mackenzie King stories. Um, <laughs> one of which <clears throat> consisted of the late Duncan McTavish and the late Leonard Brockington hearing, and they were executors, hearing on the grapevine that some crystal ball gazer in England was about to spill the beans and uh, they got on a plane or a swift boat and went over to try to talk this woman out of saying anything unfortunate and um, they were two very powerful and charming uh, individuals. They went in and had a cup of tea with this lady and spent an hour and a half getting absolutely nowhere and she sat there with a Mona Lisa smile on her face and they left absolutely totally frustrated uh, while she just sat there smiling and the way out Brockington said to McTavish, this is the first time I really feel like striking a happy medium. So <clears throat> that, uh, that was the extent of my involvement in the Estates Department at Gowlings. I'll give you Ron Gravel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, do I have to lean over or can I be heard there at the back? Okay, thank you. Well, the time is short and I've been asked to, uh, to review a state freezing today in uh, 45 minutes and now we're down to 35, so we won't waste time complaining about it. The only thing, I feel a little better than the next speaker who's only got 30 minutes and when we take 10 away from him, he's not going to be left with much. But um, for those that practice in the area, this, uh, this treatment might be a little bit too superficial and for those that uh, in some areas we get into, it'll be uh, maybe too complicated for others and we're just trying to strike, uh, as the chairman said, the happy medium. And uh, um, so this is an overview. Uh, my paper is, uh, is uh, completed and uh, in the paper I refer to a number of different types of estate freezes that I won't have time to go over here today. Um, and you can refer to the paper if you want some more detail on those. Uh, in the estate freezing uh, uh, examples I'm going to use today, I'm going to ignore the fact that there might be spousal rollovers and that we could use those for a further deferral. I'm going to ignore them completely so that, for example, when the person dies, all of the, uh, the normal taxes would be triggered if, uh, if we don't do something else about it. Now, most of us are aware that uh, the purpose of an estate freeze is to put some sort of a limit on the value of the person's assets so that when he dies, the uh, tax man will not take too much. So that when he gets to the point where he can afford uh, to pass some of the future growth along to his family, his uh, spouse and children, or, or even the next generation, uh, he might take some action to put a limit on the growth in his hands and pass it to someone else. And I'm going to suggest to you that now that succession duties have been repealed and we only have succession duties to worry about in the province of Quebec, and of course that could affect our clients who are outside of Quebec, that today probably the prime uh, goal in estate freezing is not to uh, cut down the the uh, bite that the tax man would take at the time of death, but rather to split income during the client's lifetime. 
And I think that in many cases that saving is going to be a lot more substantial than, than the uh, traditional savings that, uh, that we've talked about. Well, let me go over those two examples or two advantages. First of all, the one that I said wasn't that important anymore. If you have a client who has an asset, let's say, that's worth a million and a half dollars, and we expect in the future that that asset is going to go up by another million dollars. If that growth takes place in his hands, and he lives in the province of Ontario, and he's in the top marginal tax bracket, and then he dies owning that asset, there'll be a deemed disposition of the capital asset at the time of his death, and he will pay tax, or his estate will be liable to tax of approximately $310,000 of the million additional growth. So what we're trying to do, partially in the estate freeze, is we're trying to pass that million dollars of growth on to the next generation. Someday it will be taxed, but if we can push it far enough down the road and not having, have it taxed in, in our client's hands, father's hands at the time of his death, a substantial saving will result. Okay, now the second adva advantage is income splitting. And if we take the same individual who's in Ontario and in the top tax bracket, and let us assume that he has a wife and three children, and let us also assume that he's going to earn an additional $100 of interest income, dividend income, and capital gain income. And let us compare the tax that he will pay on that those amounts of income to what the tax would be if we could have that income taxed in in his wife's or his children's or trust for children's hands. Uh, we are going to assume in this piece that that the children and the spouse do not have any other income. And as many of you know or have read that if a person has no other income in the province of Ontario and he receives dividend income from a taxable Canadian corporation, he can receive somewhere between $33,000 and $35,000 of income per year and pay no tax on it. And so we're going to try to compare the tax in the beneficiary's hands to the tax that our client would pay who's in the top bracket. Now, for the client who earns this extra $100, on the interest income, he's going to pay tax of $62, and he's going to retain the remaining $38. On the dividend, he's going to pay tax of $39, and he's going to retain $61. And on the capital gain, he's going to pay $31 and retain $69. That's a V realizes it personally as opposed to through a holding company. Now let's have that same income go through a family holding company and although father might have some shares or, or debt from the holding company, neither the shares or the debt are entitled to dividends or, or interest. And so he gets no income and it's all going to be taxed either in the corporation or in a combination of the corporation and out at the shareholder level. We can, if these individuals have no other income, we can have the tax on the interest taken down to a minimum of 33 and a third percent for the interest, compared to the 62 percent that our client paid. For the dividend income, it will not attract any permanent tax in the corporation. For the capital gain income, it will attract a tax of 16 and two thirds percent. So if we float that money out through the corporation to the spouse and the children, we will retain, if it's not taxed in their hands, and that's not too difficult, of the interest we will retain $66.70 compared to $38, $100 compared to $61 for the dividend, and $83.83 compared to the $69 for the capital gain. So, there is no magic in, in the things we, we can do tax-wise to reduce the tax. These things are fairly standard, but you can see that there is a tax saving, and that's what we're after on an annual basis. 
And generally speaking, it's better for the corporation and the trust to float that after corporate tax income out to the beneficiaries annually because they can get that $35,000 um, annually tax-free if it's in the form of a dividend. Now, I'm sure one of the speakers yesterday or this morning commented on the use of a trust. And I would only re-emphasize here that if you intend to use a discretionary trust and you want to make the preferred beneficiary election through that trust, you must be very careful of who you choose to be the set law. The set law has to be in the direct line. I heard of a case about a month ago where a client had substantial assets. He had set up this whole estate freeze. The beneficiaries were minor, and uh, they chose the old route that we used prior to 1972 of using uncle in the United States to avoid the attribution rules. Well, we can avoid the attribution rules another way. But having uncle as the settlor of the trust prevents us from using the preferred beneficiary election. Now, if that income that we're talking about is earned rather through an operating company that our client controls, rather than the portfolio type of uh, investment through a holding company, of course, the corporate tax can differ. It could be, a, the, the corporate tax could be 25%, it could be 50%, you, it could be entitled to the manufacturing and uh, processing deduction and uh, special other considerations. But what we're talking about in the, in the uh, operating company situation is we have paid the corporate tax. Now how much can we split the income after it leaves the corporation? And again, again the same considerations apply, that is that these beneficiaries can get dividend income and have it taxed a lot cheaper than if we float it all out to father and he pays the maximum rates on it. Um, through the uh, discussion, we just talk of an estate freeze. That could be a full estate freeze on all the assets the client owns. It could be a partial freeze affecting some of his assets. Or he could put all of the assets in a corporation or wherever and he could own some of the equity shares and therefore it would still be a partial estate freeze. So we, we won't differentiate, but those are some of the options. In my paper, I start out by discussing the types of freezes where the client transfers the asset directly to the beneficiary. Or if he wants to maintain more control, he transfers it directly to a trust for the infant children or his spouse. Now those are covered in my paper and uh, because I want to cover the other types of freezes, I'm not going to cover them here. Those two types of freezes trigger some immediate tax. There are some methods of, of uh, minimizing that tax through an income averaging annuity contract or taking a reserve or whatever, but let's leave them. You can refer to the paper on those. Now before we get into the, the methods, the uh, section 85 and 86 and 51 freezes, we should comment for those people that, that are not actively involved in this area that estate freezing used to be sort of a no-no with Revenue Canada, but it has settled down a lot through the 70s. The, the methods uh, that are acceptable have become identified and they're in, they're in the Act and uh, binding rulings have been given several times, both the published ones and the other private ones. So it has settled down so that if you, if you do the freeze correctly, and you don't offend the, the uh, Revenue Canada on their sore points on estate freezing, uh, generally the methods are available and they work as long as you comply with the technical requirements. There have been some changes in the last couple of years. The main changes started uh, taking place, of course, in 1977 when, when designated surplus was repealed, the paid up capital limit and paid up capital deficiency went by the board. The, uh, in addition, uh, since then, there have been private uh, rulings that have been issued that, that have commented on price adjustment clause. The question of what kind of dividends you can take on the preferred shares when you do a Section 85 and an 86, uh, the department has given a little clearer indication there and there's more scope for flexibility. So, and there have also been a couple of amendments to the Act and I hope to cover those before my time is up. 
Now, again, one last thing before we get into the types of freezes, because it's important all the way through the three types. A person now has a choice when he takes back preferred shares in these estate freezing situations of taking a type of preferred share that when the preferred share is redeemed, the redemption will either trigger a dividend to that, the holder of the share, or alternatively, he can structure the share so that it, when it's redeemed, he will have a capital gain rather than a dividend. And so if you take your preferred share that has a $1,000 uh, face value, however that's represented, if you want dividend treatment, the plan or the method is you have a very low paid up capital on that preferred share, and the value of the share is represented by the redemption price or the redemption amount of the share. When it's redeemed, if the paid up capital is very low, then there's a deemed dividend triggered on the redemption. If you use a preference share that has a full par value, in other words, its face value represents, the, or its par value represents its face or its true value, when that is redeemed under these estate freezing situations, you have a capital gain and not a deemed dividend. Now, depending on the freeze you're talking about and what tax bracket your taxpayer is in, you might want that, the dividend type of share or the capital gain style share. Generally speaking, if the share is to be redeemed and your client is in the top two tax brackets, above 54 or 55%, he will prefer a capital gain style preferred share for redemption. If he's in the lower tax brackets, he will prefer the dividend style, so you have to keep the paid up capital of the share low. Now, in addition to those comments, the that type of share has a bearing on the double taxation effect of death and the type of share that you use in what is called a reverse freeze under section 85 uh, you also have some flexibility there whether or not you want dividend or capital gain treatment and surprisingly enough in some situations even a corporation wants the the capital gain style dividend even though the intercorporate sorry the capital gain style preferred share even though the intercorporate dividend would go tax-free. They still would prefer the capital gain style. Okay, I would like to look quickly at the Section 85 freezes. And here normally, you look at three types of freezes. Uh, the portfolio freeze, the freeze of a, an operating company, and there we're talking about the company that your client has more than a 10% equity interest in the company. And thirdly, this reverse freeze that I just alluded to. And then I want to go quickly over those, get into the Section 86 freeze and the 51, and come back to some of the other problems that are a little more current. Now, I think we can assume that, that by now everybody is, is quite familiar with the way the Section 85 rollover works. Section 85 says that if the taxpayer, and several taxpayers qualify, transfer shares to the Canadian corporation and the property that's being transferred qualifies for this rollover. If the two parties, the corporation and the transferor, file a joint election with Revenue Canada, they can choose for immediate tax purposes a transfer price which will not trigger the capital gain, the recapture, or whatever the income inclusion is. Now that doesn't mean that the transfer takes pla place for all purposes at the lesser amount. Basically, the transfer still takes place at fair market value. But for present tax purposes, they can elect to defer the income items or the capital gain items and pay the tax later. So I think everyone has now seen, seen that type of, uh, of a rollover, and that's the, that's the mechanism we use in the estate freezes. So a new corporation is set up. Before we transfer the properties in, generally, we set up the share structure. And there are two aspects there. We first have 
first have to determine who are going to be the beneficiaries of the freeze. If it's a partial freeze, then father, spouse, and a trust for the children will be the common shareholders, presumably. If it's a total freeze, then either the spouse and the trust for the children, or the trust for the children alone will be the only common shareholders. And all of the future growth of the underlying asset will accrue to those beneficiaries. Secondly, on the corporate structure, we want to set up our preferred shares so that we can get this whatever the desired result is when those preferred shares are redeemed. If we want a, deem, a, a dividend triggered on redemption, we will choose the one that has the low paid up capital and the high redemption amount. If we want a capital gain style, we'll structure it differently. So all of that is considered before we roll the assets in. And then of course, if a trust is to be set up, that has to be taken care of to subscribe for the shares for the children. Then the transferor, father, and the company will enter into an agreement, and the agreement will set out the transfer price, probably the elected values, the tax values. And I suggest to you that it should include a comprehensive price adjustment clause, and we'll come back to that later. And I'm going to suggest to you that you don't use the type of price adjustment clause that the department wants you to use. Okay, then the transfer is made, the election is filed on a timely basis within the, the time uh, that's prescribed, and then father is going to take back certain types of consideration. In a simple freeze, uh, if it's a portfolio freeze, he might take back a promissory note for an amount up to the tax costs of the various items. For example, uh, if we're talking about land that's going in and it's capital property, he will take back a promissory note up to his ACB and maybe preferred shares for the difference. He has to take some shares back to make the rollover work. Alternatively, instead of taking the note, he can take all shares back. And here we're just talking about the portfolio freeze. If it's, an, if it's a freeze of an interest in an operating company and he has more than a 10% equity, you'll see that we have restrictions there. Now, Section 85, which goes on for three or four pages in the Act, and the definitions are very complex, will allocate the cost of that asset going in to the assets that father gets back. And in my simple situation, if we're transferring the asset in at $100, that's its fair market value, and the ACB is, let's say, $30, father might take back a non-interest bearing demand note for $30, preferred shares for the balance of 70. But most of the adjusted cost base there will be allocated to the note. And in most cases, the the adjusted cost base of the preferred share will be zero. Now it could be different, but in most cases that's what it would be. That means that if father sells that share, having a cost base of zero, or he dies owning the share and there's no spousal rollover, then he's got income tax implications. And the company that took the asset over on that reduced cost base also has some tax implications if they sell the asset. Now, what rights does father have to get income out of that company? Well, they're fairly standard. If there's interest on the note, he can get that. Generally, there isn't. If there are dividends on his preferred shares, he'll get the dividend income. I'm going to suggest to you later that you don't put a dividend on. Um, if he is actively managing the portfolio investments, perhaps he could get a management fee. And some people, in the, even in the portfolio area, portfolio freeze area, would give father a, a salary and a bonus mix to maximize his tax situation. Okay, in addition to that, you could always prepay, or, sorry, pay off the note or, or redeem the shares and get money back to father. How can the beneficiaries get income? Well, basically, they're going to get it through dividend income after the corporate tax is paid. Now, for maximum flexibility, above that holding company, instead of father owning his shares, if it's a partial freeze, his shares of the freeze company directly, and mother owning hers directly, and the trust for the children 
owning theirs directly, maybe you put in another layer of separate corporations. So you have your freeze corporation, above it you have three more corporations, and above it you have the, the uh, individual taxpayers. Now, the reason for that is that you give each of those taxpayers control over when they want to take dividends out. Father might not want a dividend if it's a partial freeze in a given year, whereas the others do to maximize the amount they can get tax-free. Uh, and mother might not want dividend in a particular year and, and vice versa, okay? Now you could say you might be able to do that by different classes of shares. And, and I agree, you could eliminate the three top companies. But if you use the three classes of shares and you want to have flexibility in the income split, probably the dividends on all those three classes of shares are going to have to be discretionary. And if father's the only director or one of the directors and he's exercising his discretion to bypass a dividend on his shares and root it all out to the kids and not have it taxed, you might be inviting an attack from Revenue Canada. So I think the, the extra layer of corporations up on the top might be useful. Now, of prime importance, and I want to uh, save some time for this, is the attributes of the preferred shares that you take back. And I would like to have spent maybe 20 minutes or a half an hour giving you my comments on that and getting feedback from everybody that's here. And obviously that time isn't here. And we're not even out of Section 85 and, uh, and we've got time problems. So let me speed along then. Now, there is a special rule in Section 85, which is referred to as the deemed gifting rule. And it's found in the paragraph 85.1 E.2. And it's detrimental in most cases, but if you want to get a valuation ruling from Revenue Canada, which they rev usually will not give, it can be helpful. So let me go over those two aspects. 85.1 E.2 says that if when father transfers the assets to the freeze company, if he does not take back assets that have a value equal to the assets he transferred in, and if it's reasonable to regard that he made a gift to one of the other shareholders of the corporation, then the elected amount that father and the company chose will be automatically bumped up, and you will trigger your capital gain even though the party's elected at a different value. It's an automatic adjustment. So you have to be absolutely sure that father is getting back some, something that is very close to the value that he sent into the company. Now, that usually works to your detriment. How can it be used to your advantage? Well, Revenue Canada will not give, usually, a ruling as to the value of assets, for example, the preferred shares and the note going back to Freezor, because they say that's a question of fact and they don't rule on that. But they will now give you a ruling that after they've considered all of the attributes of those shares and all of the assets that have gone in, that they will not apply Section 85.1E.2, this deemed gift rule. Well, if they will not apply that deemed gift rule, that must mean that father got something back from the corporation that was worth the value of the assets that went into the corporation. So they won't give the, you the valuation ruling directly, but they'll give it to you indirectly. And, uh, and they're quite favorable to giving those rulings, and there have been a lot of them published and others that are private. Now, along that rule of the 85.1 E.2, that only applies to Section 85. But in the budget that was defeated in December of 79, December 11 or 13, whatever the magic date was, or not magic for others, um, a similar rule is proposed for Section 86 freezes, Section 51 freezes, and Section 87 uh, amalgamations. And that type of amendment will almost certainly be brought in in the next budget. So again, it could act to your detriment, but you might be able to get the valuation on that 85 uh, rollover. 
sorry, on, the, on an 86 or a 51. Now let's switch to the uh, situation where father owns more than a 10% interest in the company, that's an equity interest, and he owns more than 10% of the value of the shares of the company. And if we're in an estate freeze situation, the beneficiaries will be mother or a trust for the kids, then a different rule applies to the consideration that father takes back. And this rule is found in section 84.1. And it's a fairly difficult section, and in my paper, I, I try to analyze the section, then I try to reduce the formulas to English, and then in the appendix to the paper, I, I give you an example, a numerical example of how the section works, and I hope the math is right, but uh, it's difficult to, uh, to explain in a few minutes. Let me give you the results of it. The situation is that father's transferring, let's say, his operating company into another company. If he sold that company to you, a stranger, and if he owned those shares prior to V-Day, he would get the value of the company up to V-Day back tax-free. In other words, he'd only have a capital gain from December 71 to the present, selling to you, the stranger. But if he sells the same shares to a family holding company, the tax authorities don't want him to be able to get the same V-Day amount back tax-free instead of extracting the sur surpluses in the form of dividends. So they put special rules in to penalize the person if he arranges things to get those monies back tax-free. And we're only talking of the growth up to V-Day here, subject to a few comments later on. Now, how does the section work? Just let, let me give you the bottom line. If father receives on that type of transfer any hard consideration back, and the hard consideration, cash, exceeds the paid-up capital of the shares that went in, the differential will be taxed immediately as a capital gain. So father tries to take that out by taking cash from the paid up capital of the shares that went in up to his V-Day value or his cost, then that's an immediate capital gain. No ifs, buts, or maybes. Now if he does not receive hard consideration, cash back, but he only receives debt and, and PREF shares back, then of course there's no immediate capital gain, but what the section does is it reduces the cost base of the note and the PREF shares so that father can't take that same differential out tax-free. So if he takes hard consideration, there's probably a deemed capital gain depending on the values. If he, if he doesn't take hard consideration, he takes the note and the shares. And if the value of the note and shares, and I'm not talking about redemption price for the shares, I'm talking about paid up capital. If they exceed the paid up capital, the shares going in, the, the adjusted cost base will be reduced. And when they turn around to do something with that note or shares, they're gonna have the same cap or more of a capital gain than they would have if they had sold to you or I. Now, because of time, let me leave 84.1. It is a problem on, on that type of a freeze of an operating company, and perhaps you can refer to my paper or some of the other published materials on that. There are some cases where it does not apply. If father acquired those shares after V-Day in an arm's length transaction and then does the freeze, it does not apply, and he can recoup his investment through a, a transfer to a family company. But generally speaking, in the freeze situation where he had the shares before V-Day, prima facie it applies and you've got to be careful. Okay, the reverse freeze is, a, is another variation of, of 85. And just let me identify the type of freeze and then we'll move on. In the reverse freeze, you already have a, comp a company with the growth assets. Father doesn't own the growth assets. 
he has shares in that company. Rather than father doing the transfer, a new company is set up, your freeze company, and the assets are rolled down into the new company by the existing company. So your old operating company might become your holding company, and your continued operating company, your new business company, is down underneath the uh, old operating company, and that's the reverse freeze. And there are some, some advantages of doing your freeze that way, but I'd like to get on to the, uh, some of the other uh, Section 86 and 80, uh, 51 freezes. Uh, if we had time, we should consider the double taxation effects of a Section 85 freeze. And a lot of people, I think, are still under the, the uh, opinion or have the opinion that an, a Section 85 freeze always creates double taxation problems and you cannot do anything about it. And I would suggest to you that that's not quite right. There are three or four ways that you can eliminate the double taxation. The double taxation occurs because you have an asset out in father's hands that's subject to tax because of the rollover, and you've got the same, the underlying asset at a lower value in the company, and the same thing's going to be taxed twice. Now, you can avoid the double taxation at the time of father's death, but there's a timing problem, so you can't let the thing sit for a long time. You might have to move fairly quickly. And I identify three methods in my paper of eliminating that double taxation. And for those of you that are familiar with the, the third method, which is setting up a new subsidiary and then winding up that subsidiary into the holding, into the, uh, sorry, setting up a new parent company and driving your subject corporation under that parent so that you have a parent sub-relation, then you wind up, up under Section 88 and you get an increase in the cost base of the underlying asset. For those of you that are familiar with that, there is a new rule that was brought in at the end of 79. In section, uh, it's in section uh, 88.1 D.2. And it was to cut off certain other types of, of uh, tax games that people were playing. And they didn't intend it to, eff to affect getting out of the double taxation problem for an estate. But they haven't drafted the section correctly, and I've spoken to them on it, and they're going to amend it apparently. But it was intended so that that new provision would not apply against the states or to prevent the double taxation. But it might in some cases, and they're going to correct it. So if you have that situation where you're going to use that vehicle before it's amended, you might want to talk to uh, rulings or interpretations or whoever. Okay, um, time is a problem. Um, I had wanted to deal with the Section 86 freeze, and compared to Section 85, it's, a, it's sort of a pleasure to deal with 86 because there are many of the same problems that are not there, and uh, it can be done with a lot less grief. Uh, basically, there is a total rollover under Section 86, and this is the rollover or the estate freeze where father would take, let's say he owns all of the common shares of an operating company, or it could be the family investment company. And he wants to pass all of the future growth on to the next generation. Under Section 86, he can have those common shares changed into, by operation of law or otherwise, preferred shares. And then the children or the trust for the children come in immediately and pick up the common shares. And of course, all of the future growth accrues to the common shares. And this is an acceptable method now. The, the tax department approves of it. The rulings have been given. There was some concern whether an estate freeze was uh, a disposition of the shares in the course of a uh, reorganization of capital and whether he actually disposed of his common shares, ta da ta da ta da The tax department has now agreed that, that uh, this can be used for estate freezing purposes. So father moves from an equity position in the common shares over to preferred and the children of the trust pick up the, the common and the future growth accrues to them. 
uh, and everything is done generally within articles of amendment or an amendment to the charter, whatever it might be. Now, my only comment there, and there's quite a bit of, uh, of discussion on 86 in, in the paper, is that some of the literature suggests that you cannot use Section 86 for a partial estate freeze. For example, again, father owns 100% of the common shares. And he wants to freeze his, his interest in the company, but not totally. So the question is, can he, can he use Section 86 for a partial freeze? And I think he can. Uh, in my view, he can. The tax department does not object to it, although there are no published rulings on it. But what he does is, he does exchange all of his 100% common shares over to the PREF. So now he has no common shares. And it's important he does that because for this rollover to work, he must get rid of all of the shares of that class. So he gets rid of them all into the PREF. And then he comes back in as a, a common shareholder with the children and the spouse or, or whoever. And if he wants 30% of the future growth, he picks up 30% of the common shares from that time on. And the literature, as I said, suggests that you might not be able to do that, and, and I'm of a different view, and the, uh, the rulings division uh, currently says that they have no objection to that. They think that the section requirements are met. Skip 51. Um, I would like to leave a comment or two on the attributes of these preferred shares that Father takes back for this reason. There is, again, in the literature, conflicting uh, statements about what, what attributes they should have. And the professional evaluators that you might engage will tell you some other things. And if you look at the published rulings, you will see that some of the comments there are at variance with some of my comments. Now, the comments in the published rulings might be there because the taxpayer wanted it. For example, there's a ruling out that says these preferred shares will have a 12% cumulative dividend. Now, it's my understanding that the taxpayer wanted that. That was not a requirement of Revenue Canada. Now, on the question of dividends, let me get to the bottom line. You have about four choices. Father can choose a dividend, uh, sorry, a preferred share that pays a reasonable dividend. And today, let's say that that is 8%, which probably isn't reasonable. Let's say it is, OK? Father could, in a given year, waive his dividend on that. So that would be your second option. Instead, father could take a preferred share that has no dividend on it. Fourthly, he could take a preferred share that has a fluctuating dividend on it. In other words, the directors at their discretion could pay a dividend in a stated range, let's say between 0 and 10 percent. And the comments that I'm making now is that we want our client to be in a position to have maximum flexibility for income splitting. And my point basically is that if he's rolled in an asset worth a million dollars and he takes back an 8 percent dividend on that million dollars of preferred shares, we first have to pay him $80,000 or set it aside before we pay anything to the other beneficiaries. And in many cases, you won't have anything left over. So I'm suggesting to you that either you don't put a dividend on those PREF shares, and Revenue Canada has no objection to that, or alternatively, put a fluctuating dividend on and then choose from year to year. If you cho choose the third option of putting a dividend on of 8% and waiving it, I suggest to you that you may have some problems. And the tax department might use Section 56.2 to apply it against you. And in the roundtable discussion at the 1979 conference reports or conference at the Canadian Tax Foundation, they said just that that in closely held situations, they would probably invoke Section 56.2 if there was a waiver of dividend. So I think you're safer with the other mechanisms. It's, father does not need the income, and let's leave the dividend off those shares. This assumes that father's preferred shares are retractable at his option. 
And this is the, the attribute that the tax department has zeroed in on. They are presently saying, if father takes back that type of share that's retractable at his option and has a redemption amount equal to an estimated fair market value of the common shares or whatever went into the, to the company, then for valuation purposes, they will say that he received back assets worth uh, whatever went into the company. Okay? And that is the place where you'd use your 85, 1 E.2 ruling, or now under 86 or 51, and you'd ask them to rule. If there's no dividend on there, but they're retractable at the holder's option, will you invoke that gift rule? And they'll give you that ruling that they won't, if the circumstances are correct. Now, the other area where there's some, not confusion, but difference of opinion, is should the voting, should the preferred shares be voting? What leeway should the uh, freezer have with respect to changing the company after? And will the tax department put a premium on those preferred shares because of the control position of father? And this would be the, the, the old argument that was, was uh, successfully maintained by the department in the Barber case in an estate freeze situation. Now, I think we've come a long way from the Barber situation. I think that we can put controls in, and I mentioned four or five of them in my paper, uh, that father cannot change things unilaterally after the freeze and pull everything back to himself. And secondly, if we can't build those things in or you don't build them in, I think if we look at the relevant corporate law, you'll see some protection there for shareholders that used not to be there. And that's certainly the case under the Canada Business Corporations Act. And if you look at the proposed revised uh, BCA, the new Ontario Act, you'll find the same section in there that's in the Federal Act. So the bottom line is that there is some protection in these acts if you don't put it in the charter document. And then the last bottom line, the shares can be voting and father can maintain control. A fair amount of the literature suggests that maybe it shouldn't be voting. And uh, I don't think your client wants to be in that position. Now, have we still got a chairman? Yeah. What's our time? Are we up to be fair to the next speaker? Oh, price adjustment clause. Let me end on that one then. Three minutes? Okay. Cut me off if I go to Okay, I just want to make a point about price adjustment clauses, and it's this. I don't like being railroaded into using the price adjustment clause that's in IT 169. And that's where the department sets out the type of price adjustment clause that they will let you use at a later date to make adjustments. You want to make adjustments because you've made an error, maybe an honest one, of the value of the asset that went in or the value of the stuff that you took back. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you use that type of price adjustment clause, but I would suggest this as an alternative, and especially if you're going for a ruling. If you're using a Section 86 freeze, as an alternative, you might build your price adjustment clause right into the attributes of your preferred shares. In other words, it goes right into your Articles of Amendment. And the price adjustment clause basically will say, and we have rulings on this, they're not published, uh, that if the taxpayer and his advisors cannot agree with the department on the value of the assets that went in or the consideration taken back, if they can't agree, then each party has recourse to the courts and the final determination will be made by the courts after all appeal rights have, it, have expired or, or the routes have been taken, etc. And then whatever the value is then, that will be binding. And uh, there have been private rulings that the department has gone along with that and have not tied us into the type in IT-169. If you're using a Section 51 uh, freeze and you're getting a ruling, or even if you're not, you, you might build it into your, your amendments. Again, 
you could build in that type of a price adjustment clause, that if they can't, you can't agree with the department, you have recourse to the courts, and that's the, the uh, position that you and your client will live by, and the tax department. Now, they're not too keen to date to give those, that type of ruling, but they have been obtained, and uh, I suggest that even if you can't use, get the ruling, that at least you use that mechanism rather than tying yourself in so that the tax department is the ultimate uh, arbitrator on these things. At the end of my paper, um, I comment on terminating an estate freeze, and I just tell you that it's there, and some of the, uh, the avenues that you might take, it's not very extensive, but I give some suggestions, and then I ask one of you to pick it up from there and uh, write a paper and, and lighten the rest of it. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen.